spore balls out of the soil and you grow them. You start with one little ball. So then you grow it until you get a thousand pounds of it. So that's how it happens. But so we grow them artificially, so we, we're not collecting them so much in the wild anymore. So, a few questions. And there's probably a lot more good ones out there. I mean, we're just kind of, we, we grow like a couple dozen. And there's probably, for the endo, there's 150 in the world of endo, and we probably grow a dozen. And then for the ecto, there's 4,000, and we probably have a couple dozen. So there's still a lot more opportunity to do that. Endo and ecto. Um, I don't spend a lot of time on the taxonomy, but the endos are by far the most dominant type. About 80% of the world's plant species form endo. And that's most of the horticulturally important plants, the grasses, nearly all the ag plants. And what endo means is that those threads that grow into the roots actually grow into the root cells. And they put those little tree-like structures in the little footballs. They actually put structures inside the cells of the roots. The ectos also grow into the roots, but they grow around the root cells and not into it. But they both do exactly the same thing for plants. They both produce those the threads in the soil. So functionally, they're really the same. The ectos form with conifers and oaks primarily. So it's about 5% of those plants. Yes? Is there anything that you can't just want? Uh, it doesn't. It's not a good hair growth formula. <laughs> uh, we did have some people eat some tablets. It's a great laxative. <laughs> Don't eat the tablets. Um, yes, there are non mycorrhizal plants. Canola, uh, the grass pit root, so broccoli. Um, I hate to admit this actually. Amaranthus, oh. which is my last name. <laughs> it's very, very sad. <laughs> That's a good one. It, it actually varies. Like grasses start forming really quick. What causes the spores to germinate and grow, the seeds of the mycorrhiza, are root exudates. So they're dormant, they're like seeds. And over these 400 million years, they're not going to germinate anytime there's just a little bit of water or a little bit of heat in the soil. They wait till there's a root around. And the root pumps the soil with a specific chemical called formidonectin. We have many tests on that one. And that chemical triggers spore germination. And like, for example, for grasses, it can happen in three to five days, get the process going. But for conifers, it can be like four to six weeks because some of the spores, like the ectospores, have a deeper dormancy. It takes longer for them to wake up. So I'm not sure why that is. But so there's a range from you know a week to, to several months. Is there a temperature range where they do they go dormant in the wintertime? They do. They just kind of uh, go to sleep. And when soils get below 38 degrees, they just really start to stop being active. But but they're the actually more active than roots at lower temperatures. But when the soil warms back up, that same mycorrhizae is there. And Grows back out, out of the roots. Yeah, so the, the stuff in the soil, the threads in the soil, they, they freeze and kind of break off and go dormant. But then as soon as the, as soon as the soils warm up, the mycorrhizae are still inside the roots. And they start growing back out again and creating that network in the soil. That's a really good question. Yes, in the back. So you talked about um, the plants in the organic matter, and, and in Nevada here we have very low percentage of organic matter, and so humic acids being a, an important concept and component of this, how much more humic acids do you think the plants would need in our infertile soils than what you would normally find? In? Yeah, the amendments that you guys are adding to so like humic acids are great for fungi in general. So the more you add, the better. Uh, they just love it. You can't add enough. Um, Kelp is a great additive. Fish fertilizer. They love fish fertilizer. They love rock phosphate. They like the mineral dust. They love all those kinds of amendments. And so, I mean, I've never found a high end of humic acid incorporation soil that didn't help the mycorrhizae. So, I mean, 
just you can just pour it on and it just they just love it. So they, they benefit from that. So Okay, going for a while, then we'll get some more questions. Dan did an experiment with our mycorrhiza and they they were using it in a uh, restoration project, grasses on a highway project, and they actually got five times the nitrogen in the grass by using the mycorrhizal fungi in conjunction with those grass roots. Five times the nitrogen and three times the biomass because these threads that are attached to the roots can get out into the soil and get nitrogen in the organic form before it leaves the site. So, it's a big part of nitrogen nutrition, and the USDA is really putting out a lot, of, a lot of stuff now about trying to conserve nitrogen because nitrates in groundwater, nitrates in surface waters, nitrates in the Gulf of Mexico are becoming a huge issue, and the cost of cleaning, cleaning up nitrates is also a big deal. So, you know, anytime you can capture nitrogen and get it into the plant where you want it. Because the average corn farm, about 80% of the nitrogen is lost. Only 20% is utilized by the corn. 80% is lost. And, you know, the offsite effects of that are pretty profound. Not only that, but the, the fossil fuels that go into making the nitrogen is a big issue. And, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but what you'll find is once you get your soils organically amended with these products, with the mycorrhiza, you'll see that you get better soil structure. And a lot of you have seen this, and you probably have, are much more experts than I am in this particular thing, where you can see where you know, incorporations of these materials really improve soil structure. I've had farmers that have been sending me soil for almost 10 years now. And when they started, when they were conventional farmers, synthetic fertilizers, the whole thing, their soil stunk. You couldn't even open the bag because they were waterlogged, they had no soil structure, it smelled like ammonium, it was like a brick. They were growing plants in these chemical brick baths. And now after you know, converting for all these years, their soils are beautiful, they smell good, they've got organisms in them, they've got good soil structure, <coughs> and the uh, mycorrhizae produces a specific compound, the sticky organic glue that helps weld <coughs> sand grains together into a soil <coughs> aggregate, so it's a, it's a big thing. Now, if you look, let me go back, sorry. If you look at a root system without <coughs> mycorrhizae, here's a root of a conifer, and only the tips of this root have membranes which allow nutrients to pass into that root. This is a non-mycorrhizal root. So the only way this plant can get nutrients out of the soil are through these, these thin membranes at the end of the root. But if you take one of those roots and you colonize it, you get almost like these coral reef-like uh, clusters of root tips. And now this whole cluster that's mycorrhizal now can absorb nutrients out of the soil. So you're really trying to develop these feeder roots uh, in your system and this is what a lot of plants from the nurseries lack and this is what they need. And talk a little bit about water use efficiency because it's so important. And when, when moisture is limiting in soils the moisture is held very tightly in very small pores in the soil. And the roots themselves, uh, yeah, something. the roots themselves are too thick <coughs> to get into the small spaces in the soil that hold moisture. But you can see the, the fine white threads there. They are tiny enough and thin enough where they can actually access the really small, this is a piece of dirt. But good soils have a lot of porosity. And the little pore spaces are what holds water when it gets dry. So those thin little threads can get into these small spaces to access water. This is an example of grasses exposed to drought. The one on the right was colonized by mycorrhiza. It lasted another seven days without any, without any water. A lot. Because the average lawn uses about 10,000 gallons of water every year above the rainfall. And the total use of lawns in the USA is about 8 billion gallons of water a year. So if we can reduce household use, 3,000 gallons per household, it's 2.2 billion gallons of water annually in the United States. So that's, that's a difference. That's a difference. I guess that's not good. 
But there's a lot of things we can do. Okay. 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 But anyway, it can't make a difference. And this is my uh, laser pointer is, is dead. Oh. But this is the uh, University of Florida. I love show, showing this slide. It says the lower, le the lower left and the upper right were treated. The corn seed was treated with mycorrhiza. Then they subjected the corn to drought. And you can see where the corn in the upper left and the bottom right is starting to, the leaves are starting to cool and curl in response to the moisture stress. But what's really interesting is you can see where the mycorrhizae has spread when they're treated to the controls. Can you see where they've grown underneath the earth and they started colonizing the corn on either side? <coughs> and that's what will happen in your yard. If you get a good colony in there, it's going to spread from that one plant to the next plant. And in your yard, in your lawn as well, it will spread across the lawn. So once you get a healthy colony there, it should really permeate all the mycorrhizal plants in your yard. Yes? Did you say that mycorrhizae does not colonize if it's not in contact with earth? Or did you not say that? I sort of said that. <laughs> <laughs> I've said so many things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, it, it requires a root to get the mycorrhizal seeds to germinate and grow. And it does require a root to supply the energy. It doesn't have to be right on the root, but you've got to be within a few inches of a root to get the thing to kick on. So, yeah, it needs to be, the roots are going to supply the energy to drive the activity of the fungi. So, yeah, roots are critical. Otherwise, it just sits there. But it will spread from root to root. So if you have one root that's colonized, like on the left here, and those threads are growing out in the soil and it sees an uncolonized root tip, it wraps around there and connects the two, and it colonizes, the, in this case, the control. We witnessed this kind of stuff for years in the research basis. This is so cool. Um, there's our companies. We've got about 14 university studies in the last three years. Um, there's literally 70,000 studies on mycorrhizae now. So if you have a particular plant that is a troublesome plant, there's generally lots of research on that. And we have a we keep a database at our office of all of the research activities. It really is, there's a lot known. And so if you have questions, we have a website you can go to and ask questions and we can usually find some of the research for you. But there really is a lot of research out there and for all kinds of different things. But again, lots of it's published. I won't spend a lot of time on it. This is kind of an interesting one though. Oh, my um, This is the University of California Riverside and they use mycorrhizae getting their turf established. We usually get about twice the cover during the growing period. Yeah, and this is a tree to plot. This is a tree to plot here. See a tree to plot in the back. And this was published in the Journal of Turfgrass Science. But it's a really good way to get lawns established because they don't go through that limited <coughs> stage where the seeds germinate, can access resources in the soil and just sit there. Mycorrhizal grasses can continue to grow. So we average about twice per you not asked, I did not know this one dark little spot here. <laughs> no, I do not know what happened there. I don't know if he took his dog for a walk. <laughs> We've got a lot of research on restoration sites, tough soils, uh, like the soils in this part of Nevada, you know, very difficult. And we're getting we're getting plants established, lots of cover. Uh, we'll we'll take these baskets and we'll bury them in the soil and we'll inoculate some baskets and not inoculate others, and we pull the baskets up see what happened in the basket. So for a lot of people that, that want to see the differences, we'll, we'll bury baskets and we'll inoculate one and not inoculate the other. And then at the end of the growth season, you see for yourself. You know, you generally get about three times, four times the roots in the inoculated areas compared to the controls. And something you can always count on. And the, the roots love inoculated material. Yes? So would it be possible for you to take a poor soil in a turf area and go through and inoculate after you core aerated with uh, mycorrhizal and be able to reduce the amount of fungal activity that occurs on the surface of the plant and increase the soil structure and the health of the plant all at the same time? Basically, if you can get the, aeration is a great, that's a good point, because aeration is a great time 
to get the mycorrhiza established. Because you've opened the soil up, the propagules, the inoculum will fall into those holes. It's got access to the roots. It'll get, the, get it going. The mycorrhizae do not help with any kind of foliar diseases. So if you've got things growing on the leaves that are causing problems, the mycorrhizae don't help at all. But in terms of soil diseases, they do help a lot. And they help in really three fundamental ways. One, they produce antibodies. Fungi are great at producing antibodies, penicillin. And so they produce antibiotics which protect the roots. So that's way one. The second way is fungi, and this just seems to seem kind of bizarre, but fungi are made of chitin, which is the same material that's mammal claws and insect skeletons, because they share a common ancestry with insects. And the chitin is pretty impermeable. So that chitin armoring helps protect succulent roots, which is what you get if you add a lot of chemical fertilizer to your soil, you get succulent roots. That chitin makes them less like an armor, like wearing armor. And the, and the disease organisms can't get in, so that's the second way. And the third way is the mycorrhizal filaments, they, they get all the nutrients, so there's nothing available for the disease organisms. They're out there gathering all that stuff, so there's not all this free nitrogen, free potassium that the diseases need to do to proliferate. So you tie up the resources, you armor them, and you produce antibodies. And that helps deter diseases. And that's why in a lot of natural systems, you don't have culture diseases. It's because the organisms naturally, biologically control for them. So yeah, it helps a lot. Yes? <coughs> Well, I'm not a big root hair kind of guy because there really aren't, no, aren't any root hairs in nature. So root hairs are an artifact of laboratory experiments where there's, they're dealing with sterile substrates. So you really go out into like a natural forest or you go into a natural grassland. You can count 100,000 roots and you wouldn't find a single root hair. They just don't exist. But um, to answer your question, I'm anti-root hair, you can tell that. Because I hate textbooks that publish pictures of root hairs. Because you never, they're not, that's not a real thing. That's a laboratory artifact. But don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> but to answer your question, um, they go about three inches from the root. On most of the endomycorrhizal plants, about three inches away from the root. So that's how far those little threads are getting out into the soil about three inches. Now some, there's some fungi that will go farther. There's some that will go three meters or nine or 10 feet. So um, there's a few that'll go 50 feet. So it really depends. But for our species on average, you know, one growing season, you'll get out you know, three or four inches away from the root. But how far up the root can go up the root? the root is bigger than that. Oh, yeah, they kind of grow with it. That's a really good, good point. And this question was, do they grow with the root as the root grows out? Because the root's going to grow away from the threads, continue to expand in the soil. And the fungus kind of is just a little bit back from the root tip, maybe a quarter of an inch behind. And they're kind of following as the root tip grows. So they can sort of follow the, the growing tip in the soil as it moves through the soil. But it's just, it's just behind the apex of the root growth. It's another question I've never had. Well, when the, root, when the growing season's over, they just kind of break off and fall off. But as soon as the soils are being pumped with energy, they start to grow out again. And they're, they're, but they're kept in the roots alive. They're, they're protected inside those root cells. So in and around those root cells. So when the energy starts flowing again, they grow back out of the soil. So as, as, as we try to repair fire areas, mm -hmm. is that something that's been looked at as, as combining Mycorrhiza with with the reseeding efforts. Oh, is that it's huge. We probably have done half a million acres in the last four years. Right. We did the San Diego fires. We did a lot of fires in Colorado. We do a lot of wildland rehab. 
and it's funny on the fires is that the low intensity fires does not hurt the mycorrhiza. It's the high intensity areas because they can only handle temperatures up to 140 degrees. So above 140 degrees, you pretty much fry them. So then you have to reestablish them. But um, so the low intensity fires, it would be a waste of money to add mycorrhizae because they tend to retain in those areas. But it's the higher intensity areas. They just, you know, you just sterilize the soil basically. But yeah, it's being used very commonly in wild, wildfire rehabilitation. Two questions. Is there a shelf life in the, in the package mm -hmm. for this? Mm -hmm. And the other question is, what about polymers with that? Polymers are good because they help plaster the mycorrhizal seeds to the root. So the polymers have been good, and Plant Success produces a root dip gel that has been very effective. Um, and the shelf life in the bag is two years. Um, the spores are dormant, the propagules are dormant, and what causes them to germinate is root activity. So they can handle, they just sit in the bag waiting for that the big day. And there's going to be some root activity. <laughs> They don't like above 140, but they actually like freezing. They, the freezing, freezing thaw cycles does not hurt them at all. In fact, it probably even stimulates the eventual germination. <laughs> How long will they keep what? How long will they keep the long Well, how long will the long keep? They've got, they germinated spores from the pyramids. So what's that, 3,000 years? The ectospores are really long lived. So they had some spores from the cedars of Lebanon that blew into the pyramids and a group of fellow colleagues actually germinated them and grew them on pine trees at Oregon State University. So and that was what, what, 4,000 years ago or something? So they were old. The ectos last a long time. It's the endos that are, that we have the two-year shelf life. A lot of them probably last longer than that. Am I going over my? I need to wrap it up. Okay, let me just go on how you use the stuff, and then I'll let you guys all go. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, um, what about silicone diseases like Fusarium or Verticillium that already have some establishment? When you, can you use that to suppress, or will it outcompete those diseases? That's what my really cool video was about that didn't show. <laughs> I had Fusarium growing and being controlled, but in my own experience, if you get the mycorrhizae established early, you can control Fusarium, Phytophthora, Verticillium, Ithium, if you get it early. If you throw the mycorrhizae into an infested Phytophthora area or infested Fusarium area, it's already out of control. Mycorrhizae don't help. So getting there early makes a big difference. I have some great pictures of side-by-side -side trials with mycorrhizae on tomatoes, peppers, turf grasses with and without mycorrhiza. It's funny thing is the mycorrhiza, mycorrhizal plots never totally control the disease organisms, but you get like 90, 95% control, but never total control. But you never have these outbreaks. It's always a little bit left over. It's really kind of interesting. I don't know why that is, but, but you get effective control if you get there early enough. And there's really, a, if, I'll give you my card afterwards if you have because I can send you some specific stuff on, on those. So I want to at least cover how to use the material because that's probably just the plant success products that come in root dip forms, gel granular tablet forms. The gels, the, the polymers work great with bare root plants. You just dip them in a bucket. It's like a thick gravy and uh, it sticks to the root systems. But the plant success has a soluble material that you can use in hydroponics. You can inject it through irrigation systems. Just have the irrigation, the watering system, add the spores to the planting medium. <coughs> so it's a quick and effective way of adding it. Um, there are some great soil incorporation pro products here where you can use the mycorrhiza when you're planting. Works great with organic fertilizers, or even at the time of planting, you're doing your site preparation, you can sprinkle it around. It's a great way to do it. Or if you've got containerized plants, obviously you can just take a spoonful and, and drop it into the planting hole because you're going to put the root systems right on top of it. Uh, you can even inoculate some of these giants. These are like 
250,000 pound pine tree that destined for the Wynn Hotel. Really full of root systems. We kept these things alive for almost three years in Vegas in the hot sun using mycorrhiza. So, I mean, you can even treat large specimen trees and, and keep them alive. Anytime you have access to the root system, is a good time to add the material. Um, it's an example. This was actually Hurricane Charlie. It's a big, uh, a big ficus that came down. Someone happened to have some plant success inoculum with them. They dumped it in the hole. Here it is. Three days later. Here it is. Four months later, and there it is. Fourteen months later. So it stimulates a lot of root growth. This is that plant success granular material. So, I mean, if you've got access to the root system, that's the key. You can inject it. There's, there's powders that you can mix with water, and you can inject it in the soil around the, the trees. You can auger it in, um, bird mulch it in. There's different terms for this. Create holes in the soil and you put them in the soil. Remember, it's the roots that cause the spores to germinate and become active. It's a lot less expensive. When I first started, uh, it was really expensive to use mycorrhiza. Nobody could afford to do it. It's now a bargain. It's cheaper than fertilizer in a lot of cases. And you don't have a lot of the problems associated with chemical fertilizers. It's, it's pretty safe. I love this sign. That's the speed exception. Beware. Car getting hit by fall, like falling tower. Yeah. But it is safe material. Um, it's a lot safer than some of the other things that we're using in the lawns and landscapes. Um, we put the species that we've selected for for these products are really top performers that can handle a lot of the stress and fertility that we see in these urban and suburban areas. So they're concentrated forms, which I like. They're putting enough material in there that's going to be effective. There's some manufacturors that put it like a sprinkle full of mycorrhiza and, you know, four cubic feet, you know, and it's really not enough to make a difference. So you really want to look at the labels to see how much material is in there. Um, and of course, you want support for your products and research that's been done and claims. So let us guys know. <laughs> you can make some serious claims about these products that have mycorrhizal fungi that have, if you reestablish the living soil, you can say you're going to have more roots, you're going to have drought protection, you're going to have more nutrient efficiency, you can use less fertilizer. These are real claims. You don't need to back off. You don't need to back off. There is so much data to support this. We can say with certainty that you can do these, that you can have these benefits. There's no, there's no debate about it. So tell your growers that, tell your customers that, hey, these are the benefits and don't be shy about it. Because there's plenty of evidence to support this information. We're mycorrhizae.com, probably the least visited website on the planet. <laughs> but that's how you spell it. M Y C O R R H I Z A E. It is a good resource. There's a lot of the movies that didn't show. Uh, we'll hopefully show on our website. We've got the History Channel featured the whole mycorrhizae thing in our company on uh, Modern Marvels. So you can watch that. Um, there's a lot of interesting video, and you can always ask questions on that website. So I'll leave my card up here too. And then, then Tim from Plant Success um, is a great resource as well.
But let me tell you that my dancing <coughs> background really was not the proper training for this particular performance. My mother, being German, would say to me, my real name is Gisela, and she would say, Gisela, come, we must dance again. And one, two, three, four, and I would say, oh my God. And so I learned the polka. <laughs> and of course, I grew up with uh, Beethoven and uh, old papa music, you might say. And I, my mother really taught me so much. I'm going to share quite a few stories about her. But when I was 17, I thought I wanted to try out to be a dancer for a chorus line, which is a Bob Fosse production. And I got there. I was number 797. And there were about three or 4,000 people there. And the dancers had bodies that went from heaven to hell and back to heaven again. They were built. They were dancers. And I was like Lucy, the wannabe dancer. And I would look at them and I'd say, well, what's a double pirouette? And often they would look at me like, honey, if you don't know what a double pirouette is, you shouldn't be here. So I'm here selling organic <laughs> So the other thing I want to share with you really quick is there are two things that my poor mother still doesn't understand. And one is that her only daughter is not married and never has been married, and at the rate I've traveled, may never be married. But you know, that's their generation. That's, they think that that's what's important. And the other thing is, is that her only daughter, the only one in my family so far to have gone to college, went to college to become a shit saleswoman. <laughs> <laughs> that is the other thing she does not understand. So, okay, so in all seriousness, what I want to share with you, and then I'm going I'm to do this very, very quickly, talk about Dr. Hurt and some of our products, because I think you guys really, you're going to go home with some extraordinary information. That's really fantastic. I think right now there is an opportunity in our industry when the economy is struggling, our industry does very well. When the fuel prices go up, people stay home. They want to take care of their yards. We have an opportunity right now to capture it, but we have to be prepared for it. We can't <coughs> say we're going to wait until the customers come in. We actually are doing extremely well. You know, these first couple months into the end of the year. And we want to make sure that our customers are prepared. Another thing I see, I think that we are an extraordinarily special group of people. And I really mean this. We are connected to agriculture. We are people that have great value in the work that we do. And I think people are starved trying to find meaning in the work that they do. <coughs> And I really believe that we have something that we can be proud of. And I just wanted to share that with you because we are not just landscape investment advisors. We're not just, I mean, the, the amount of knowledge that we have to have in order to teach people how to grow plants in their yards is extraordinary. I think we also have an opportunity to create a sanctuary for people, to help people create sanctuaries in their own yards, as well as have our nurseries be that for people so if you need to slap a coat of paint on something to create a nice, you know, ambiance, or if you need to have more water features, or have more chimes, or music when people walk in, I think those are all things that we can really offer in the industry. And so that was something I just wanted to share with you from my heart, because I can't really do what I do without that. That's, that's an element that I have. I have to make a difference in what I'm doing, and I feel like this message has been a really fantastic message with people. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Kerr, the short condensed version. Um, I want to share, most of you know my background, but a few of you don't. My, I actually studied at a production agricultural school at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. Everything we learned about was fattening up the crops, whether it was livestock, whether it was greenhouse crops, whether it was row crop, crops. <laughs> 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 So the whole focus, and even though it was an extraordinary experience, and I had a terrific education at Cal Poly, again, my whole focus, though, was in the use of synthetics. And when I, when I graduated, um, I went to work for the Department 
Department of Agriculture for about five years. And that's when I really got to see how challenged the organic farmers were. And when I, and then after that, I, the first brand that I helped build was a brand called Whitney Farms that some of you may know about. That product line was the first product that opened the doors to mainstream organic gardening. And what those fertilizers were, thank you very much. He's holding out a beer. <laughs> Those products were blood meal, bone meal, cottonseed meal, rock phosphate, and maybe some kelp meal. That was the mix. And when I came to work for, Dr. for Kellogg's, and the brand that we had was Dr. Earth, I remember my customers saying to me, okay, so now you really sell the best shit on the market. Now this is really the best product. And I remember going home and thinking about it. And I said to myself, I, I really thought about, I didn't want to just say, now that I'm selling this, this is it. I really thought about what Dr. Earth offered. This was the first product that infused fertilizers with beneficial living organisms. And that, that, just the fact that what Milo created was a fertilizer that was infused with seven different champion strains of beneficial living organisms. Six of them are bacteria, one of them is a fungus. That had the ability to speed the whole process up. Okay, let me back up a step. All chemical fertilizers, as you guys know, let me, let me also say this. I'm speaking to a room of professionals. I know that. I'm just going to try to share with you some of the things that I've learned. I don't stand in front of you as, as someone that has all the answers. It's not possible in our industry. And I just realized how little I really know after listening to my camera analysts. <coughs> when we look at chemicals, the whole focus of a chemical is to push plant growth. But it does nothing beneficial for the soil. The organic fertilizers, their whole focus is to feed that whole, <coughs> that whole biosphere of living organisms within the soil. The soil food web, if any of you have not read about the soil food web yet, you can Google that. Go online, it's, it's extra, there's more information than you'll have time to read. The soil food web, a condensed version of that, is it's all of the living organisms within the soil. That's what's literally making our soil healthy. So all of the microorganisms, the bacteria, the fungi, the actinomycetes, the nematodes, these are all the organisms that we can't see without the use of a microscope. Then we have all the macroorganisms, all of the organisms that we can see, the earthworms, the wireworms, the grubs, the moles and the moles. And all of these creatures, all the micro and macro, make up the soil food web. They are constantly decomposing organic matter, making it available to plants. So plants take nutrients when they need it, instead of being force-fed. When we force-feed plants to grow with chemicals, the kind of plant performance that we have is a plant that's forced to grow and it has a thinner cell wall. When you have insects, let's just say like piercing, sucking insects, land on the foliage and the foliage is very thin or the cell wall is thin, when that piercing, sucking insect lands on the foliage, it's going to do a great deal of damage because it's so thin. On the other hand, we can use organics that are feeding the soil system, allowing all the living organisms to break down organic matter, whether it's compost or whether it's fertilizer. The plant takes the nutrients when it needs it. It produces a plant with a thick cell wall. That translates into a plant with a thicker leaf surface. Insects cannot do the same type of damage on a plant like that. From the 40s until the mid-1990s, our whole focus was how can we dominate Mother Nature, force her to grow, give us larger yields than we'd ever seen, grow it much quicker than possible, harvest it, get it out to market, and get the next crop on the ground. But what we were not paying attention to is the fact that we were killing all of the biology on the soil. Particularly in the United States, when you look at the fact that we monocrop, we grow one crop, hundreds if not thousands of acres, we cut down all the hedgerows, we cut down anything that would invite beneficial living organisms back in, and what do we do? We create the sterile environment. Today our focus is exactly what my people here talked about and what Todd addressed earlier. Today is what's going on below our feet, what's going on within the soil system? How can we assist Mother Nature in all her brilliance to, to create that balance? Now I love asking this question. How many of you have found balance in your life? <laughs> in 10, 20 years, we're going to see 
my piece is 16. I'm hoping that in 10, 20 years, she knows what that means. I think we're all seeking that in our lives. And that's really what we're trying to assist within the soil system, is how to create balance so Mother Nature can solve her own problems. Now, Dr. Earth fertilizers are considered probiotic. I am going to keep this very short. I do promise you that. I say that in the next talk, talk, talk. So the term probiotic, we're seeing that term more and more on yogurt commercials. I know I have absolutely increased the sale of yogurt all across the West, wherever I go. The term probiotic means to encourage life. We all know what antibiotics are. When we take an antibiotic, we hope it's going to kill whatever makes us sick. But we know that it kills all the beneficial microflora in our system. So one of the things they tell us to eat is yogurt, right? But not all yogurt is created equally. Just not like not all wine is created equally. You want to have an organic yogurt. You want to have a yogurt with live cultures in it. One of the live cultures that they tell us to eat after we've had antibiotics is lactobacillus acidophilus, right? Well, that's one of the live cultures that we add to the fertilizer. It has the ability to break down cellulose material. Now, we are the most sophisticated composting machines on the planet. When we do not have all the right find all the right cultures within our own system, all the right microflora within our system, not only are we not digesting food efficiently, we're not utilizing the nutrients efficiently, and our entire immune system is tied to our digestive tract. So all of us can really benefit from eating yogurt or taking live probiotic cultures. I look at the American diet the way that I look at the chemical world. If I eat a hamburger, fries, and a soda on a regular basis, I know I'm going to fatten up. And I also know I'm not going to have the ability to fight off illness or disease very effectively. It is the same with the plant world. It's a stretch, but it's the same. If I have a plant-based diet of vegetables and fruits, and I eat my salmon and I get my omegas, I'm not going to fatten up as much. And I'm also going to have the ability to suppress illness and disease much more effectively. Is absolutely a very similar system. So, let's see, how do I want to condense this version? Okay, so the three primary functions of these probiotic living organisms. The first function is they secrete enzymes to break the organic matter down. The second function <coughs> is one of the bacteria, you're all familiar with Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt, right? <coughs> we put three different species of Bacillus in the fertilizer. One of them is called Bacillus cereus, C E R E U S. It produces phenols and penicillinates, which are antibiotics. A lot of things that Mike talked about. You might say, wait a minute, if you just said antibiotics kill things, why would I want that in a fertilizer? It only has an effect on disease-causing pathogens found in the roots of the plants. Now we're talking about more than just feeding plants. We're talking about having beneficial living organisms that suppress disease-causing pathogens. The third thing is these powerful glues that are, that are secreted. It's all about the end byproducts. And these glues, for those of you that have worked hard pan clay soils, when you first go out to work that soil and the rototiller tines are skipping over the top of it and you can barely get a shovel into the soil, but after three or four or five years of working that soil, the soil becomes more friable or has better tilt. That is from all those powerful glues transforming a tightly bound soil that's, that has no oxygen in it into a well aggregated soil. Okay, so that's really what you're getting with the technology. I won't go into the mycorrhizal fungi because I can do it in service. With the Dr. Earth fertilizers, you're going to get that, that technology in it. We have everything in four pound box, 12 pound, the, all the blended fertilizers are in a 12 pound. Our number one selling size is the 25 pound which is a real testament to the Dr. Earth product. This is the number one selling size. You guys have done an extraordinary job. Actually, we have not had a price increase in eight years that I've been with Kellogg's. The only product that we have raised prices on is the 50s because it was barely making any money, any money on it. So you guys have to know, you really have a product that almost everything else has gone up and these prices have really held on for eight, as long as I've been at Kellogg's. Also, we have it in the 50 pound bag, the Dr. Earth Supernatural, this is one of the number one selling fertilizers all around Lake Tahoe. And this is actually the number one selling fertilizer in the entire Dr. Earth line. 
Mike talked a lot about nitrates and what a problem that nitrates are, but what we're finding up here is the phosphates, which are a real problem for all the algae growth. This is a 935 NGK. These fertilizers are considered water insoluble. The number one issue we are having in the landscape industry and in the farming industry is runoff issues. And that primarily has to do with a lot of the that are being produced. So this is really a dynamite product. Uh, actually, it also keeps rabbits out of the garden. Are you guys experiencing that as well? Okay, it keeps rabbits out of the garden. Okay, um, let's see. I'm going to share with you on the back of your gardening guide that you guys have. We'll look at it later. The Dr. Earth Life. This is a 555 NPK. It's a homogenized pellet, which is very much like the Dr. Earth Supernatural. All the other ones are meals. Okay. The homogenized pellet does not have any binding agents. It's just through compression. So we had a lot of people that had ground covers or just wanted to be able to broadcast it into their container plants. We actually have a lot of nurseries using the 40 pound bag, of course, not this size, in their nurseries now. So just know that we have a homogenized pellet that can be broadcast out. The key is you want to water well afterwards because you're not cultivating it into the soil as much. Just remember this as well, any organic fertilizer will work best if it's lightly chicken scratch into the soil. The more contact it has with soil, the better it will work. Okay? This comes in a 5, 25, and 40 pound bag. The liquid, um, our liquid Dr. Earth, look at it as uh, an organic version of a miracle Grow. This is a 333. Think of this as your booster. This is a fantastic product. Always use the granular in the soil, or the, the meal products in the soil. Why? Because it creates good soil structure, it diminishes disease, and it lasts for a long time. Use this as your booster, okay? And again, it's only a 333. Don't let the low numbers fool you into thinking that it's not going to be effective. Todd, have I missed anything on Dr. Earth that you can think of? Okay, I'm going to go over to the soils real quick. I'm going to come down. And actually, before I do that, I want to introduce Excuse me for not doing this sooner. Mandy Lester and Jeff Woodworth, they are from The What Show, which is a public access show. And I did a presentation in the fall, I was sharing that with you earlier at Carson Valley Garden Ranch. And this gentleman saw a write-up that was in the newspaper and he came out with this big, really intimidating camera. And we also the products already know how these products are to be sold. So I'm going to do this very, very quickly. Gardner Blue has been around for about 20 years. Kellogg's bought it about 10 years ago. We wanted a brand that was just for the Independent Garden Center. So Gardner and Bloom and Dr. Earth are only available at the Independent Garden Center. You will not find it at the chicken <coughs> store. So everything's natural and organic. This potting soil is the product that most of you have been carrying for years and years. The Gardner and Bloom potting soil it comes in an eight quart, one cube, and a two cube. All 100% natural and organic. This is more of a fur-based and forest humus-based and then it also has some peat moss in it. So this has a little bit more wood in it, whereas our newest product, which I consider a grower's mix, has a lot more peat moss in it. Didn't you bring a truckload of this in on your early buy? So this is what I would consider more of a peat-based mix <coughs> with mycorrhiza. This is more your specialty mix. This is more your all-purpose indoor-outdoor container mix. This is more of a grower's mix holds moisture a little bit more, this one will drain a little bit more. So just really depends on which product you're looking for. I find that the organic, or that potting soils are somewhat of an emotional product. When people put their hands in it, once someone figures out how to grow plants with a particular potting soil, they're going to seek that same potting soil out. Uh, planting mix. Now, we know that potting soils are for in containers, or we can also amend the ground you know, with a potting soil, but typically for in a container, and a planting mix is typically for in the ground, but we break our own rules. The planting mix, this is an all-purpose planting mix for trees, shrubs, and bedding, but if you have containers that are wine barrels or raised beds, and you want to know what you can add into that, you can use this and plant directly into it. Don't be afraid to do that just not in smaller containers, five gallon and larger, okay? Uh, when we reform, when we repackage these, we reformulated them, and in some of these, so our nutrient cocktail for most of our product line is chicken manure, worm castings, bat guano kelp, alfalfa meal, that was new, 
oyster shell, and dolomite lime. That's our nutrient cocktail. So, um, soil building compost. This is the number one selling product of this line. Is that correct, Todd? Correct. Okay. So, this, what I like about what we've done at Kellogg's with Master Nursery and Gardener and Bloom is we put, a, we put a lot of information on the front of the bag for you. So this one tells us that it's for hard pan clay soils, but this is also for sandy soils or DG soils. You can use it for any of them. Um, it's also used as a planting mix, a seed cover, or a topper on a lawn. <coughs> it would really be outstanding to use um, as a topper on a lawn twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. Always put your organic fertilizer down first. And if you're mulching your yard, or your customers are going to be mulching, always have them put organic fertilizer down first. The more contact it has with soil, the better it'll work. Um, this is also, you, my, this is my, one of my favorite mulches in this line. In, in the master nursery line, it would be the black forest. Anything I'm missing on that, Mike? Bare root, also bare root trees. You can use the, the soil building compost. Also, three cubic foot, it's a great value. Part of Supreme, this is a dynamite product. 15% chicken manure, also has the endo and ectomycorrhiza. Now this product is definitely an amendment. This is something you want to use as an amendment or as a top dressing or a mulch. The only thing I'd plant directly in Harvest Supreme would be maybe a tomato. Have you guys ever seen these <coughs> holes poked in the bottom? You set the bag down, cut the top, put a cage in it, and plant a tomato in it, you'll get a tomato about four feet tall. This is great for amending wine barrels or raised beds that you, that you grew something in last year, but that you need to fortify. A little of this goes a long way, okay? It's nutrient rich. Now, both the rose and acid planting mix, both of those can be used in containers, direct planting into containers, or in the ground. Okay, I'm gonna just keep it that simple. Warm castings, warm castings are fantastic for plants. We put it in all of our blends. It's nutrient fortified. It's also in a small particle size, so it goes into solution easily, so the plant can take the nutrient up quickly. You can use it on indoor plants, any of your outdoor plants, container plants, uh, anything that's stressed <coughs> in your yard as well. Warm castings are also great deodorizers for plants. <coughs> Premium topsoil. If you need a true topsoil, when I came to Kellogg's, we had probably four or five different products that we called topsoil. But they, none of them were true topsoils. They had too much organic matter in it. So if, you have, if you're digging trenches for irrigation and you need a true topsoil, this is it. When you pick up this one cubic foot bag, it is really heavy because it's a sandy loam. We also put some organic nutrients in it so you can grow some, some things in it. Okay, so that is a true topsoil. And then this, this is our plethora of poop. I love saying that. Derived from farm manures, dairy, steer, chicken, poultry waste, rice hulls, and forest humus. High, high end chicken manure. And then our straight all purpose premium chicken manure. That's the Gardner and Bloom brand. And Todd, do you want to come down and wrap it up with Master Nursery? Thanks, you guys. We're almost finished.
<clears throat> we got cans. We got we got your uh, plastics. <laughs> My hero. 